Good evening. I'm Andrew Chang. Adrian is away. Tonight, Saskatchewan brings in mandatory vaccination measures. Possibly we have been too patient, and that time for patience is now over. Is it enough to slow down a surging fourth wave? Also tonight, Albertans consider their premier's pandemic response. I think it's a good thing. This is wrong. This is so wrong. How it's being played in the federal campaign at issue is here. An uptick in air travel is exposing problems at airports from Canada to the UK. We're a catalyst for the economy. And after Canada's players scored soccer goal. We couldn't find any women's jerseys and we were pretty disappointed because they had a bunch of men's jerseys. The potential cost for the players, the fans and the future. This is The National. New pandemic restrictions are coming into effect tonight in Saskatchewan and more are on the way because the province's COVID cases are surging, its vaccination rate is lagging and its healthcare system is under pressure. The number of COVID hospitalizations in the province is about as high now as it has ever been. And the fourth wave curve is not bending yet. ICU admissions are following the same pattern. Capacity getting precariously stretched. And so today, the Premier took action, announcing a new mask policy and one for proof of vaccination. Omaira Issa takes us through it. Saskatchewan has one of the lowest vaccination rates in the country. Only about 67% of people have at least one dose. For weeks, Premier Scott Moe has been trying persuasion to get that number up. Today, he took a sterner approach. The government of Saskatchewan has been very patient. Possibly we have been too patient. And that time for patience is now over. Starting at midnight, all public indoor spaces will require masks. Then starting October 1st, there will be a mandatory vaccine passport system for some businesses in the province. It's an about face for the premier as is this. New vaccine rules for government employees. The opposition says it's all too little too late. So much of the damage is already done. Scott Moe has allowed us to reach a state of dire emergency. But unlike Alberta's premier, Jason Kenney, Moe says he won't apologize and says he stands by his government's decisions throughout the pandemic. Uh, this government has attempted to make the very best decisions that we can collaboratively. On the streets of Regina, reactions are mixed. I definitely think the masks are a good idea and they should stick around for a while. I think we should get as close to zero cases as possible before we stop wearing them again. They shouldn't be doing that, you know, because like, you know, everybody's out here, it's free. They should keep that on the down low. I feel that's needed. He pulled the plug way too fast. As COVID cases surge to all-time highs, frontline health workers have been begging for restrictions. The big question now, will today's measures be enough to help a system many experts say is on the brink? We are still in really, really big trouble right now. So it's a start. We're going to have to monitor the situation closely. Okay, so Omaira, today Saskatchewan's chief medical health officer laid out just how dire things could get. Yes, Andrew, uh, Dr. Shakib Shahab says that uh, if the situation continues well, patients with COVID-19 won't be able to get beds in ICU, nor would patients with other medical conditions. And the Saskatchewan Health Authority also said today that the system is being tested like it's never been before. So today, the message is clear right here in Saskatchewan. Wear a mask and get vaccinated. Premier Scott Moe is hoping that will help curb the spread of COVID-19 right here in Saskatchewan. Omaira well, Issa, thank you very much. Now, Canada's chief public health officer says the whole country can learn from what's happening in Saskatchewan and Alberta, which is also seeing an explosion of COVID cases. Don't be complacent. We've got to be highly vigilant um, on this virus. When you see it accelerating, act fast. Dr. Theresa Tan pointed out there are still about 7 million eligible Canadians who have not been fully vaccinated and said the data shows it is precisely the areas with low vaccination rates that are seeing surges in infections. Now, new public health measures in Alberta can't come fast enough. That province reported more than 1,700 new cases today. That's its highest daily rate so far in this fourth wave. And just for some perspective, per capita, that's six times higher than in Ontario. Here's Carolyn Dunn on how the new measures are going down with Albertans. 
Lineups for testing that look like traffic jams, the surest sign of exploding COVID case numbers. And since that Vax Passport announcement, more people have signed up to get vaccinated. So I think now, you know, I should get it because it's getting a little bit worse. And I think it's important that I should be protected. But I think it's a good thing. Uh, the government is moving in the right direction for our safety. But not everyone is happy to get vaccinated or prove it. If I don't get vaccinated, I probably can't go to work soon. And this is wrong. This is so wrong. Like it or not, hundreds of thousands of Albertans have been online to download their vaccination record. We'll have to make sure that we have a uh, space between, uh, two, between people. And many businesses, like restaurants, are making sure customers know they'll have to prove their vaccination status. What, what I think of, uh, of what the government is doing at the end doesn't really matter. Uh, we need to be open and uh, to keep people employed as well as the business going. That will surely be welcome for Premier Jason Kenney to hear. His COVID-19 response has decimated his popularity in Alberta. An unleashed and outgoing Calgary Mayor Nahed Nenshi made his view clear to CBC. I don't want to be too nasty about it, but I've worked with a lot of provincial governments. I think Premier Kenny is my sixth premier. I've never seen a government this incompetent. In the meantime, ICUs are now at the highest level of surge response. Staff looking for any corner to put an ICU bed. This includes spaces such as operating rooms, post-anesthesia care units, observation spaces and recovery wards. So far, Ontario and Manitoba say they are looking for ways to help Alberta's plea for help with ICU spaces and medical staff. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, Calgary. Now, Justin Trudeau said today Ottawa is sending ventilators to Alberta and will do whatever it can to help. But he also used the province's new measures as an opportunity to attack Aaron O'Toole, something the Conservative leader faced questions about today. In a moment, Hannah Thibodeau shows how he handled them. But first, Ashley Burke on the Liberal Wedge. The choices that leaders make in a crisis matter. Today, Justin Trudeau tried to tie his main rival to the Alberta Premier's handling of the pandemic. Just a few days ago, Mr. O'Toole was still applauding Mr. Kenny for his management of the pandemic. And that's at the heart of the choice Canadians need to make in this election. And the Liberal leader asked a question he hopes voters might ask themselves. Do you really want Aaron O'Toole? to be sitting across from them at the Premier's table talking about how we end this pandemic when he himself can't stand up to the anti-vaxxers in his own party? But Trudeau faced a question of his own. Why didn't he intervene to help Albertans? It's not my job to judge or to criticize or to certainly not to tell people what to do uh, at, at the provinces. They are duly elected. Trudeau's closing arguments in these final days centers around trust. He's trying to drive home his message that his party is the only one that can be trusted to fight the pandemic. He's repeatedly applauded Jason Kenney's handling of the pandemic. Today, Aaron O'Toole was repeatedly asked if he still does. As Prime Minister, I will work with all premiers, regardless of strike, to fight against the pandemic. A pandemic that we need to fight and Mr. Trudeau didn't fight. He called an election, a $600 million election. I think Canadians are sitting at home wondering about the pandemic itself, not specifically about this election. Who do you think did a better job handling the pandemic? Provincial Premier Jason Kenney or Prime Minister Justin Trudeau? Canadians are sitting at home as you said, wondering why we're in an election. No, I, I asked about who handled the pandemic, who handled the pandemic better. Question after question answered with talking points, but no mention of the Alberta Premier by name. Trudeau spoke out about Kenny today. Singh spoke out about Kenny today. And O'Toole pretended he'd never heard of Jason Kenny today. The Conservative leader trying to walk a fine line with four campaign days left to go. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Truro, Nova Scotia. And coming up, a closer look at what Alberta's spiraling situation could mean for both Trudeau and O'Toole. Chantal, Andrew, Althea and Elamine will join Rosie for Ad Issue in about 20 minutes from now.
And don't forget, our Canada Vote special on Monday. We'll all be here live. Rosie, Adrian, Ian, David Cochran. I'll be here as well for election night results and analysis. It all kicks off at 6.30 p.m. Eastern on CBC News Network, CBC Television and Radio 1. You can also stream it on CBC Gem. Well, one file waiting for Canada's next government, allegations of racism and discrimination going back decades. A proposed class action lawsuit by black civil servants, past and present, is now one step closer to going ahead. Farmer Alley spoke to two plaintiffs about what they say they have endured and what they want to see change. This practice of excluding black employees, of, of almost dehumanizing us, it has to stop. It's been four months since Marcia Banfield-Smith left her job at the Department of Justice, but she says the scars from her time there run deep. I'm almost afraid to do anything else because I think if I make a mistake, because people make mistakes, it's inevitable. Will I then, or will they say this is why they never took her on at the Department of Justice? Banfield Smith was hired as a paralegal and went to law school while working for the government. But in 19 years, she was never promoted. Carol Sipp is also part of the lawsuit. And it became a living nightmare. She says she endured targeted harassment for the 26 years she worked as a public servant. Even though this behavior, it seems, was going on for a long time, nothing was done about it. And there are many more stories of anti-black discrimination within the federal government. The proposed class action lawsuit now has more than 1,000 plaintiffs. The group filed a motion this summer asking the federal government to urgently create a mental health fund for black civil servants. When we reached out to the government then, they told us that an employee assistance program already exists. Now, with the federal election campaign underway, an apparent change in tune. The creation of a black mental health fund is now part of the Liberal Party re-election platform. I'm hopeful you know, as we sit here in an election, that our Prime Minister, that every leader will take the opportunity to speak to these issues of equality, of fairness. It's very important to me because I look at the young children growing up and I don't want them to go through what I personally went through or, or the others have gone through. It's not fair. A fight for change for the next generation. Farah Morali, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a surge in travel across the country has meant long lineups at airports. To keep things moving, Canada's two biggest airlines have asked employees to pitch in and take on extra tasks. Some are even being asked to donate their time. Kyle Bax shows us why this is happening and the backlash. Air travel is taking off, reaching the highest level since the pandemic began. But all the activity is creating challenges for airlines. Staffing shortages have led to flight delays and cancellations, showing it's easier to cut jobs than to restaff. Ramping up is another issue, uh, especially in the airline business, where uh, some of you know a, a number of the uh, of your employees are federally certified. It's one reason why the two largest air carriers want staff to volunteer for Air Canada asking managers to take on extra duties, helping customers at Pearson in Toronto. For WestJet asking workers to donate their time, assisting passengers requiring wheelchairs in Calgary. We heard about it when our members saw it and were very upset about it. Several unions are pushing back, concerned about providing free volunteer and zero cost labor, stressing it's unacceptable and an added burden. The bottom line is, is it creates conflict and none of that is helpful at this time. Some American carriers too are asking staff to volunteer at airports. The airline industry is still recovering financially with many planes still parked and various travel restrictions around the globe. Are they desperate and trying to save money or is this just a way where they are trying to take advantage uh, of the situation? I guess the hope on the part of the employer is that employees will see this volunteer work as increasing the likelihood that they'll be able to retain their jobs in the long run. Um, that's the only reason I could ever see an employee accepting to do this type of volunteer work. Air Canada and WestJet both say they have recalled thousands of workers so far this year, but they continue to face operational challenges in some areas as more travelers take to the skies across the country. Kyle Bax, CBC News, Calgary. 
The U.K. is trying to revive its travel sector with an announcement of big changes expected tomorrow. New measures that could have real impact for Canadian visitors and the airlines that fly them. Chris Brown has the details from London's Gatwick Airport. The arrival of Air Transat Flight 122 at London's Gatwick Airport wouldn't normally be a reason to get out onto the runway, but this was the Canadian Airlines' first flight to the UK in almost a year, so it was a big deal. Well, we can see already the pent-up demand as and when countries open up. You, you've got an aircraft here today which is going to run out at almost 100% full, and that's because Canada opened up last week. For Britain's travel sector, it's been an especially disappointing post-lockdown relaunch, with too few bookings, too many cancelled trips and too much paperwork. In regular times, Gatwick's single runway can often be the busiest in the world, with 55 aircraft taking off or landing in a single hour. These days, it's about a third of that. European airports, on the other hand, are on average twice as busy as British ones, which suggests pricey COVID tests and Britain's ever-changing traffic light system to rate the COVID risk in countries has put people off. I think the green light and red light amber system has been changed almost weekly without any guidance before, so yes, it's been very tough. Today, British media are reporting that the government here will finally heed those pleas and instead have two lists, go and no-go, and eliminate the most pricey PCR tests before and after flights. The CEO of Gatwick told us that will make a huge difference well beyond the UK. We're a catalyst for the economy uh, locally, uh, but we're also a catalyst for routes at the other end. So when we're flying into Vancouver, into Toronto, uh, into Calgary, we know that what we're enabling is for global business to take place at both ends of that route. Industry groups here say what's really needed to get more passengers back into the skies is global agreement on what the rules going forward should be. Chris Brown, CBC News at London's Gatwick Airport. Well, as Friday morning dawns, Russians start to vote in their own parliamentary election. But the outcome isn't really in doubt. The ruling United Russia Party ally of President Vladimir Putin is expected to dominate Briar Stewart shows us how the rival candidates were eliminated, and she speaks to some Russians who don't seem to mind. Trying to connect with voters when you're a member of Russia's beleaguered opposition can be insurmountable. Even more so when your candidate is in jail. It's the most terrible elections I ever seen since my birth. Tatyana Usmanova is the campaign uh, manager for Andrei Pivovorov. A well-known activist who was arrested and accused of being part of an undesirable organization. That's one of the many punishing labels slapped on anyone trying to challenge the Putin government in an election that's impossible for the ruling party to lose. We have uh, no freedom. Uh, no, uh, almost no opposition candidates are registered. So that's why it's difficult to call it the real elections. In recent months, there's been a brutal crackdown on high-profile members of the opposition. Some have been pushed out of the race, out of the country, or imprisoned. Last year, Alexei Navalny nearly died after being poisoned. He's now in jail, banned from running for office. But there are some who think that's where he belongs. He betrayed the motherland, this woman says. She lives in the small remote village of Sputnik and in a community that shares its name with Russia's space triumph and now its COVID vaccine. You don't have to look too far to find people who support the ruling party. People want stability, this woman says. They want guarantees, not revolutions. But Vladimir Karamurza believes revolution is the only way forward. He's an outspoken critic, also banned from running. In those countries where governments cannot be changed at the ballot box, sooner or later they are changed on the streets. And I'm, I fear this is the way we're heading uh, here in Russia. There's no sense that will happen anytime soon. The signs read, together we choose, but the choice is severely limited, given the beaten down opposition and a system that's been manipulated to keep Putin in power. Briar Stewart, CBC News, Moscow. Well, an Edmonton woman who captured Canadian hearts and the attention of some of Canada's biggest names says goodbye. We are all, each and every one of us, 
sending you so much love right now. Coming up, an outpouring of love and a cancer patient's last message. Plus, final election countdown and the big names come out. I am here for one single reason, to help elect Aaron O'Toole. And it's why I'm asking you tonight to vote for the Liberal Party. Will this benefit the leaders? Rosie is here with the Ad Issue panel. And it was a glorious moment for women's soccer, but sporting their name on your back? Easier said than done. My parents shouldn't have to go on a website and order my jersey. We're back in two. Welcome back. New research is raising concerns about a potential link between cannabis use and heart attacks. The Canadian study suggests young people who use cannabis are at higher risk. Christine Birak looks at what we're learning and what we still don't know. For some who've smoked, vaped, or eaten cannabis edibles, this research hits home. It felt as if my heart was going to explode out of my chest. Mike Stroh smoked pot almost every day for over 15 years. Now a large peer-reviewed study has found, while the risk remains low, those aged 18 to 44 who use cannabis at least four times a month have nearly double the risk of heart attack over non-users. If you're a young individual that may perhaps be recreationally using, the dose you may consume may be significantly higher and have some of these physiologic effects. Researchers say cannabis use can lead to an irregular heart rate, increasing the amount of oxygen the heart needs while limiting the amount that's being delivered. It's definitely an interesting study. But researchers note it doesn't prove cause and effect. The study also found cannabis users were more likely to smoke cigarettes, vape and drink alcohol, which can also increase the risk of having a heart attack. I think the main takeaway message here is, is for people to be reminded that cannabis, like alcohol, is not a harmless substance. For some, the study's findings come as no surprise. As somebody who uses cannabis on a regular basis, you know that there's risks. I don't know anybody who's experienced it, uh, but, you know, it's, it's a drug. Bad things might come from it. Mike Stroh started smoking pot at 12. He's now a therapist who talks to young people who often don't know the harms. I think it's important to address that assumption that it's sort of this natural herb that grows in the garden. Studies have shown cannabis can help patients with certain conditions, including epilepsy. But experts say the drug is far more potent than it used to be, and much more research is needed to understand the long-term health effects. Christine Birak, CBC News, Toronto. An Edmonton woman has died following a battle with cancer, but her public openness about such a private battle captured the hearts of so many Canadians. In her last days, Julie Rohr wrote about the challenges Alberta cancer patients like her face during this fourth wave of the pandemic. Her posts on Twitter led to an outpouring of support, including from some high-profile Canadians. Actor Dan Levy sent this surprise message. Sending you so much love right now. It brought Rohr to tears. Oh my gosh! <laughs> I... That's so beautiful. Thank you for making that happen. Ryan Reynolds also reached out. You are beloved uh, by so many people. Today, her family posted that she had died and included her final message, part of which reads, I leave this earthly world with no regrets. I've told the ones I love how much I love them. I have opened my heart to life, and many of you have opened your hearts back to me in turn. Well, next on The National, the White House gets involved after a rap star posts a wild vaccine claim. The tweet read around the world and how U.S. public health officials are responding. But first, Rosie's here with that issue. Hey, thanks, Andrew. The panel and I will be discussing Alberta Premier Jason Kenney's handling of the pandemic and how that is now playing out on the campaign trail. Plus, former prime ministers showed up for their party leaders this week. Could that help or hurt? Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and El Amin will be back to talk to all of us right after this. It is
It is now clear that we were wrong, and for that, I apologize. Alberta Premier Jason Kenney last night after declaring a COVID-19 state of emergency in the province alongside much stricter measures and vaccine passports. This just two months after Alberta lifted most pandemic restrictions with some praise from the Conservative leader. And when Aaron O'Toole was asked repeatedly this morning whether he still thinks Kenney handled the pandemic the right way, he had this to say. All provinces have shifted and adjusted based on the various waves of the pandemic. But what the provinces have not had is a consistent and reliable partner in Ottawa. Mr. O'Toole is still letting the anti-vaxxers within his own party run the show. So it's just a few days now to go till Election Day. Will any of this sway voters to make sense of the last few days? And because it's Thursday, I'm here but with at issue. Chantelle Bear, Andrew Coyne, Althea... Althea Raj and Elamine Abdul Mahmoud. Good to see everybody. Appreciate you being here. We're going to see a lot more of you in the days ahead. Um, but this was an interesting development uh, in Alberta and one, obviously, that the Liberal leaders seized upon. Is it the kind of thing uh, that is potentially an opening for the Liberal leader? Is it troubling for Aaron O'Toole? I'm going to start with you, Althea, because I, I believe you're following the Conservatives right now. Yeah, actually, I, I do think it has the potential to change things. I mean, the Liberals have been trying to make the ballot bo box question, who um, can handle the pandemic better? Who do you trust to handle the pandemic? And Mr. O'Toole and Mr. Singh, actually, had been trying to make the ballot question more of a referendum on Justin Trudeau. And I think that the referendum question seemed to be getting traction. Like, you know, why would you give your vote to a leader who called an election only for his own personal gain? Like, the Liberals have not been able to get away from that. And yet, yesterday, with Mr. Kenny's admission that um, he got it wrong, that he regrets being over-enthusiastic of reopening, it puts the pandemic now front and center in this election campaign. And Mr. O'Toole has had a lot of difficulty, not just with members of his caucus, as that um, that pack showed. Uh, he himself has is on the record endorsing Mr. Kenny, uh, endorsing his reopening plan, and that is a very devastating attack at this time when many people may have died because. Jason Kenney decided to reopen the province too early. And and it comes also on the same day, we should say, that Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe also had to put different measures mm -hmm. in place and say he's also going to move towards a vaccine passport. Chantal, your thoughts? And so did Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick, so I'm guessing the circle has been squared on this. Uh, it's not good news for Aaron O'Toole, and I suspect that if it had been possible uh, in light of rising cases numbers for all those premiers to wait till next week to do what they did, they would have, and it tells you how dire the increase in cases is that they could not mm. because their own political situation was becoming untenable. Um, it's damaging on two scores. These are allies of Aaron O'Toole. There is no denying that, and they are coming late to the vaccine passport uh, issue, but it also will feed into Maxim Bernier's rhetoric yeah. about freedoms being taken away and give more motivation for people uh, uh, who believe that to go out and vote for Maxim Bernier. Okay. A Andrew, your sense, you're, you're in Calgary tonight. I'm not sure what you're hearing out there, but your sense of how this is playing out. I think you have to separate logic from politics here. Uh, logically, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to, for this to be attached to O'Toole. Uh, there's no doubt that Kenny screwed up, but lots of the premiers have screwed up in different ways of, of all different parties, because this was all within provincial jurisdiction, which the federal government was happy to leave to the provinces. The provinces were left to handle questions like lockdowns, questions like administering the doses of vaccines, etc. Uh, so that happened under Justin Trudeau's watch. You can't blame Trudeau for that, but you can't really blame O'Toole for it either. This it just it's the matter of different jurisdictions. See, if we were talking about federal jurisdiction, then or in federal the federal role in this, we'd be talking about the failure to close the borders quickly enough. We'd be talking about the failure to stockpile personal protective equipment. Uh, we'd be talking about, uh, you know, the, the shutting down of the early warning systems and so on. So that's the logic. The politics is Kenny's a conservative, O'Toole's a conservative. In politics, guilt by association is fair game. 
And so there's no doubt that O'Toole is going to take a pacing for this. Yeah, I, I guess the, the one caveat I would put forward is that, that Mr. O'Toole applauded uh, Jason Kenney's management of the pandemic, which, which I mean, you know, maybe he does think that he did a good job up until now, but it seems like the, that's the connection point too, is it not? Yeah, well, I, mean, it's, I was going to uh, say that I don't, I don't buy that at all. I don't buy that it's not connected at all. I mean, uh, earlier today, our, our CBC colleague, Travis Dunraj, had a Twitter thread that just kept on adding on and on and on about several different journalists who kept on asking the question of Aaron O'Toole of, hey, why did you say that, uh, that uh, Alberta handled this pandemic better than the federal government did? And he had no answer to this. And it actually kind of made clear that um, the conservative campaign really had one gear, which is that this was going to be an election about the COVID recovery. Um, and now that the ballot box question is once again how to manage a pandemic that is still ongoing, and this, of course, has highlighted that again, uh, it, it, it appears as though O2 is kind of struggling to find that other gear. Andrew, you want it back in there, then Chantel? Oh, I, 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 just the point would be, uh, again, the logic is if you allowed Aaron O'Toole to be prime minister, then premiers would, like Kennedy would screw up. Kennedy's, you know, premiers like Kennedy screwed up under the current prime minister. It, it just doesn't actually make the connection. Sure. Chantel? A uh, couple of points uh, going back uh, to this notion that uh, Aaron O'Toole did say that uh, Jason Kenney had handled the pandemic better than Justin Trudeau and he's got to live with that statement. Comes at a terrible time for him in the campaign, but that's too bad because it wasn't a fact uh, that Jason Kenney had handled the pandemic better when he taped that thing. Mm -hmm. uh, second, yes, premiers who are powerful do have influence on the prime minister if they are of the same persuasion. And this is a federal leader who has been stating that he would never challenge anything that a province does, never challenge a provincial law. He also has to live with that. And third, uh, blaming Justin Trudeau for calling a federal election to deflect blame, it's fair game to, deb to debate the federal election timing, but it has nothing to do with how Mm -hmm. Jason Kenney or Scott Moe have been yeah. uh, managing the pandemic. La last word very quickly, Althea, then we'll come back for one more round. Yeah, there are three things I think that hurt Mr. O'Toole because basically Mr. Kenney yesterday said mea culpa on these issues. One is the vaccine passports, which Mr. O'Toole has refused to say whether or not he supports. One is the fact that he was trying to be, you know, uh, on both sides, not accept uh, mandatory vaccination. And that seems like everybody's going in one direction, including the business community, and Mr. O'Toole's on another side. And third, I think this is the most devastating. He kept referring to vaccination as a personal health decision. Yeah. And Mr. Kenny yesterday said, basically, yeah, it's a personal health decision, but everybody else is implicated with it. And basically, this is a decision for which there are societal costs. Okay, we're going to take a short break. Thank you for uh, that conversation. After the break, we're going to talk about some familiar faces that came out this week. That's the kind of leadership and vision that Aaron O'Toole is going to bring to the new Canada. Vote for the Liberal Party, for the Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, that I knew is a in a long time because I was in the house with his father. It's my favorite part of the campaign when former prime ministers come out on the trail. Brian Mulroney last night supporting Aaron O'Toole and of course Jean Chrétien uh, supporting Justin Trudeau. What do those uh, uh, those endorsements, those outings say about this last pitch to voters? Back with me now, Althea, Chantal, Elamine and Andrew. Chantal, what, this is obviously, you know, a, a try to boost momentum and all sorts of things. But what does it tell you about the campaign, if anything? I don't think you should put them in parallel. I believe uh, Jean Chrétien coming out gives, uh, and it's not meant to make you so nostalgic that you suddenly want to vote for one or the other. Right. It's meant to make liberal or conservative foot soldiers feel so good about their party that they're going to work harder to get the vote out. And I believe that is true of Jean Chrétien. Uh, that is the impact he has on liberals who are working to get liberals elected. Brian Mulroney is another proposition in Quebec. I'm not sure that uh, there is an organization to get the vote out, but he is popular. But west of Quebec, 
the problem with the Brian Mulroney outing is that there are many foot soldiers who see themselves as part of the Stephen Harper party mm -hmm. who are saying, what is happening here? Mm -hmm. Or where is this other successful prime minister who apparently has been consigned to watching reruns in his station? Uh, Andrew, I mean, it also it, you also wonder if it's trying to send or, or reinforce the message that Erwin O'Toole is uh, more moderate than, than, than maybe other conservatives out there. Yeah, I think the Mulroney thing may have been more aimed at the, at the undecided voter, uh, at trying to reassure people. I mean, this has been the whole Tory campaign till now has been to try to reassure people that uh, we've, we've uh, tamped down some of the more unruly factions within the party. We're squarely in the mainstream. We're actually not that much different from the liberals, et cetera. Uh, and Mulroney was a highly successful conservative prime minister, you know, back to back majorities. Uh, uh, that's a good thing to be able to say. You know, sure. if you if you liked the conservative brand, then maybe you'll like uh, maybe you'll some of that association will rub off on the current crop of conservatives, particularly the idea of progressive. But but to Chantal's point, Althea, is there could it backfire? Could it actually upset some people? Oh, I already know lots of Harper people who are upset <laughs> by seeing Brian Maroney yeah. out on the campaign trail yeah. for Aaron O'Toole. Um, I just want to say that I agree actually wholeheartedly with everything Chantal and Andrew just said. The one thing I will add, though, is speaking to conservative incumbents in Quebec, where Mr. Mulroney did the outing um, in Orford yesterday, um, they believe that it's going to help them with national nationalist Quebecers, that Mr. Mulroney can remind oh block supporters that, you know, there once was this great big conservative family where nationalist voters were included in there. And wasn't it great? Look at all the things we accomplished from fighting apartheid to the acid water treaty to free trade when you were all in the big family together. And this is what we can accomplish together if you vote for a party that can actually form government. And so that was something that uh, conservative incumbents were really ho hoping mm -hmm. that Mr. Mulroney's outing will do. Yeah, I will say I know Harperites, people who are fans of, of Stephen Harper, who who were pleased to see Mr. Mulroney too. So uh, yeah, well, I don't know that everyone was I mean, upset, obviously. Uh, Elamine, and then uh, I think we got to wrap it up. Yep. I mean, I mean, sure. If you are a Harper conservative, you might be pleased to see Mulroney. Sure, it's nice to see old friends, but also at the same time, Harper governed this country for a long time, and yeah. it feels like a really uh, significant sort of absence to just kind of skip that altogether. Um, and, and, and also, I don't think we should be awarding Aaron O'Toole any points for subtlety here. He also said as much, right? He said that uh, he is maybe trying to move the party away from what yeah. you might have come to think about it. And so I, I, I think if you're a Harper conservative, sure, you might smile when Mulroney's on, on TV, but uh, you can't be too happy about saying, hey, man, we actually managed to govern. Yeah. We, we managed to win a majority, need we remind you, as, as, as recently as just 10 years ago. Do, does it, do you think, Chantal, if, if, it's, if there's a, a real desire, as you all seem to agree, to reassure people, what does that tell us about the state of the O'Toole campaign? It tells us something about Aaron O'Toole, who ran as the anti-return of the Red Tories Mulroney style a year ago for the leadership, and is now happy to uh, have uh, Brian Mulroney contrast with Stephen Harper about the nostalgia in Quebec for the Mulroney era. Yeah, all these things are all true, uh, but I guess you have to put them to the mix, the failure of the Meech Lake yeah. Accord, et cetera, et cetera. So, no, there are not that many fond memories of great successes when you put <laughs> that failure inside the mix for a nationalist Quebecer. Okay, I got to leave it there. Thank you all very much, and people will be pleased to hear that you're coming back Sunday night before election night, and you'll all be here, of course, for many, many hours on election night. So thank you all very much. That's uh, at issue for tonight. You can catch me and my show, Rosemary Barton, live at 10 a.m. this Sunday. Uh, again, we will have more of The National on Sunday as well. One last time before the polls close. Okay, sounds good, Rosie. Meanwhile, next on The National, are women's soccer fans getting shortchanged? couldn't find any women's jerseys, and we were pretty disappointed. The hunt for a Sinclair jersey more difficult than you might realize. Stay with us. Well, the three COVID-19 vaccines approved for use in Canada are getting new names. The Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine will be known as Comirnaty. Moderna is now Spikevax, while AstraZeneca becomes Vaxevria. Health Canada says the rebrands mark their full and final approval. Okay, the battle against COVID vaccine misinformation has taken a new turn in the United States after some bizarre statements from rap superstar Nicki Minaj caught the eye of the White House.
No stranger to controversy at the best of times. Minaj caused genuine alarm over recent comments on Twitter. On Monday, the Trinidadian-born performer told her millions of followers that she skipped New York's recent Met Gala because of its vaccine requirements, saying that if she gets the shot, it will only be after she's done more research. Then she shared an unverified story about how the vaccine made a Trinidadian friend of her cousin impotent, even causing his genitals to swell up. Now, an angry Trinidadian leader dismissed it as misinformation, as did U.S. health officials. But Minaj has influence with millions of followers. And today, the White House took a more diplomatic line. We offered a call uh, with Nicki Minaj uh, and one of our doctors to answer questions she had about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. Uh, this is pretty standard and something we do all the time. Minaj says she is open to it. Now, Canadian women's soccer is more popular than ever these days. And after the team's incredible win at the Tokyo Olympics, the fan base is growing. But if you're thinking that would lead to a boom in sales for things like jerseys, not quite. Sonali Karnik shows us why it's been hard for some fans to show their support. The Canadian women's soccer team gave the country more than just a celebration. This is the moment that Canadians celebrated across the country. But it was also an inspiration for girls playing soccer with their own dreams of a gold medal win. Seeing like how determined they were and seeing that how really far you can go by just practicing, it really showed me maybe I could do it. And they want to show their appreciation and celebrate their favorite players. We couldn't find any women's jerseys and we were pretty disappointed because they had a bunch of men's jerseys. So we thought that was really unfair. And it isn't just a problem for fans of the team. Even some team members couldn't get their own jerseys for their own families. My parents shouldn't have to go on a website and order my jersey. They gladly would. <laughs> they gladly would, but like they shouldn't have to. All of this has this soccer store owner shaking his head. They won and the day after it was, that's it. There was just not much done with it. I think a lot more could have been done and, um, and it's unfortunate. But in the U.S., it's a different story. The women's team has won both the World Cup and Olympic gold several times. Their jerseys for both individual players and the national team are some of the biggest sellers on the market. In Canada, it's a missed opportunity. As a result, they're missing out on revenue. They're missing out on opportunities to connect to, grow the fan base, and ultimately opportunities to grow the game. Soccer Canada now has a commemorative t-shirt and poster to celebrate the women's gold medal win. But jerseys for star players are still in short supply if they're even being produced at all. Sonali Karnik, CBC News, Montreal. Now, we should add to this story today, Nike, the company that produces the jerseys, told CBC News that it does plan to respond to the demand by making additional jerseys available. Okay, besides watching the Olympics, what did you do this summer? Well, one Ontario girl spent it rescuing butterflies. When it's trying to escape it, we tag it and release it. I already need to know more. We learn how she does it. We'll even get a few tips in our moment. Morgan Mansfield is only seven, but she's already got the chops to be an animal conservationist. And you'll understand why in just a moment. She spent the summer rescuing caterpillars and their eggs and raised them to become monarch butterflies. Not just one of them or two of them, but a hundred of them. Her part in helping a species at risk is tonight's moment. Look at that. I've been raising monarchs. We've been doing it for three years. Because they're very close to endangered. The Western population is only 2,000 left. We've been finding eggs and caterpillars from our neighborhood ditches and milkweed groves and rescuing them. Sometimes when one is a big fat caterpillar makes its chrysalis there. It stays in the cage so it can dry its wings. When it's trying to escape it, we tag it and release it. Don't cut down milkweed if you find it in your backyard. Leave it for the monarchs. And if the city comes to mow it down, tell them to stop mowing down milkweed so we can raise monarchs. 
Well, I gotta say, this is so great for so many reasons, because it's not every day that you find someone who is that young willing to kind of get their hands dirty, right? Not just do that, but to do something in their free time that's pretty educational, but also even third beyond that, to do something that does good, right? Even if it's a small little piece of the overall puzzle. Uh, Morgan, I think you've got the right idea. That's The National for this September 16th. Hope you have a great night.